IBM actually has put a lot of people on OTEL for mainframes. And surprisingly, if you are doing your firmware updates or whatever, your, your old school IBM main, mainframe actually emits OTLP. Like it's not like it can't be done. As one of my beloved colleagues at Google said, nobody wants to be an observability astronaut. We're excited about today's episode because we're talking to Ben Siegelman, co-creator of OpenTelemetry. This podcast is all about interviewing builders, and Ben is a star in the open source community, recognized for his efforts at standardizing observability and code instrumentation. Ben started at Google in 2003 and in 2005 began work on a distributed tracing project named Dapper. He then went on to co-found Lightstep in 2015, where he started to work on a project named Open Tracing. This project eventually grew into OpenTelemetry, also known as OTEL. OTEL changed everything by specifying a common model for sending data to an OTEL collector. Like many observability providers, we use OTEL extensively at Highlight. In fact, OTEL powers our underlying SDKs and ingestion engine. Cool. Well, Ben, thank you for coming to the podcast. For the listeners, we know each other through, I guess, YC, and then we sort of met each other, and then you learn more about the company. But I think you have a pretty interesting founder story. What is the spiel on Ben in terms of the last 10, 15 years of your journey? And and um, yeah, quick intro about yourself too. Sure. Um, I'll try to keep it brief, but you can ask me for more detail. I mean, I was um, uh, fresh out of college. I went to Google as an engineer in 2003 and spent a couple of years working in ads, which I frankly really didn't enjoy. And then decided to do something different. My manager at the time had 120 direct reports, um, direct reports. So he had no idea what any of us were doing. Uh, and I started working on what we would now call observability. And that was 2005. And I basically more or less haven't stopped doing that. I worked at Google for about nine years, working mostly on tracing and metrics stuff. And then um, left uh, with the intention of starting a company actually in social media. That was the one piece that wasn't observability. That company, which I'm happy to tell you more about if you're curious, was a complete failure from a commercial standpoint or even from a product standpoint. At least I had the good sense to realize that. But it did cure me of the desire of ever working on consumer products ever again. So that was good. And I still had enough um, in the bank account to pivot to something else. And I realized I actually really missed the space that I'd been working in at Google. And um, and so Lightstep was actually a hard pivot from a completely failed consumer social media product. So anyway, uh, I was lucky enough to be joined at that point by my two co-founders. And we actually had a fairly straight shot. Like it wasn't um, a- after that pivot, it was it was actually we were just very lucky on a bunch of things, including market timing and and along the way. Um, I think uh, we did you know, some commercial things I'm proud of, but I actually do think open telemetry and the kind of open source stuff that we were working on is also something that I'm really happy with and continue to be involved with. So there's that kind of dual track for me. That's that's that. That's the short version. Happy to go into more detail yeah. if you want. But Yeah, yeah. I guess the rest of this will be the long version. <laughs> ben, tell tell us about that social media company. What What did it do and what made you think it wasn't successful? I, I feel like a lot of people work on something for a long time and they don't know when to stop working on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I think the intention behind it was right on target and I actually think it's still accurate at the time. I guess it really began in 2000. That's not when I started the company, but in 2007, 2008, Facebook at the time was really on the ascent and I hated that product. I just hated it. Like every time I used Facebook, when I stopped using it, this is kind of pre-mobile I just felt bad, like every single time. And it was because I was comparing my life, uh, which was generally, I've had a very, very fortunate existence and I'm not complaining, but like like any person, it's complicated, whatever. And I'd compare that to other people's vacation photos and it just felt bad. And I realized that this was not uncommon. At that point, people had started doing some studies and I just kept on talking about it. My wife eventually was like, look, you know, why don't you just like shut up and do it? Um, well, shut up or do it like one or the other. And so I I left Google in 2012 with the intention of, of starting a company around that. And we did build a product that was meant to allow people to connect around their actual, uh, experiences, whether they were, you know, easy or difficult. And it created an environment where that was possible. It, It wasn't a complete failure. It actually did keep, there was a cohort of users that were very loyal and had high retention. So the retention numbers were actually good. They were probably on par with like a Twitter or something like that, but the growth numbers were just horrendous in terms of virality. And 
I started interviewing the users to try to get a handle on this. And what I realized pretty quickly is that we'd built a product that was incredibly attractive to depressed introverts. Um, many of my friends are depressed introverts, nothing against depressed introverts, but they do not talk about products. They do not. And they would say, this is the most, this is the most important product, my phone. I use it every day. This has been so important, it's meaningful for me, blah, 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 blah. Who would you tell about it? And they would say, I would never talk about this with anybody. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, so for me, I think, the combination of a product that was doing more or less what I wanted, like that was the idea, it was supposed to help people feel, you know, more validated or something. The, the fact that it was kind of working, but also was very much not working. Um, and the only way we could actually attract users, ironically, was taking out very, very like provocative ads on Facebook. <laughs> it's like, this is like not working. I mean, it was very expensive to acquire users. And anyway, one, one of my uh, investors at the time, apparently uh, told me later that they anonymized my last board deck where I basically explained why this is never going to work. And they used it with some other portfolio companies to help them realize why they should stop and they should fold. You know, I give myself some credit for looking reality in the face, but um, yeah, it was pretty obvious just because, you know, if you're building a consumer product and it doesn't, it doesn't grow organically, you know, you're done. And there was, and as I said, like we had an option to pivot into like a bullying app, which I'm definitely not going to do. Um, uh, probably an option to pivot into like a paid therapy app. No judgment about that, but just wasn't my vision. And also, right. frankly, an option to pivot into like a super pervy hookup app. People were definitely going down that road, but this also was not my vision. And so I was like, all right, this is this is done, you know. Um, and I, you know, I was sad to kill it, but you know, obviously, no regrets in retrospect. So you worked on that, and then you're like, hey, let's pivot. You decided to pivot. Was the light step vision already in your head, like since having worked at Google and worked on open telemetry and that kind of stuff? Open telemetry, and, oh, just to be clear, open telemetry started in 2019, light step started in 2015. So there were a solid four years before I uh, One of my employees was amazing, amazing, amazing. That was one of the good things about that tiny, tiny startups that we did have some good people. Um, and the only other engineer uh, was this guy who ended up, you know, I had a coffee with him and I said, look, like this company is not working, but I love working with you. Like, do you want to do something else with me and be an actual co-founder, not an employee this time? And, um, and he said, you know, I'm really glad you mentioned that because I was about to quit because this is not working. <laughs> so he became my co-founder and then another person I worked with at Google. Uh, so that was Ben Cronin. And then this guy, uh, Daniel Spoonhauer goes by Spoons. He was someone who I tried to recruit him for my social media company. He's like, I love working with you and that's a terrible idea, so no. Um, but then when I said we're going to do something for developers, he was like, great, you know, count me in. So he became a co-founder at that point too. Uh, and I just kind of recapped myself to make that work. Uh, we made a list of about 60 things that we felt like we would intellectually enjoy working on for 10 plus years, which I think is something you need to do if you're starting a company. And then we eliminated the ones that didn't have a market opportunity. And so we went from 60 to three, <laughs> 57 of them, we felt like were not viable. There were three that sort of made sense. Um, one of them was basically light stuff. And we didn't call it that, but that's, that's what it was. And yeah, it was, it was similar to, you know, it wasn't like, Hey, let's repeat what we did at Google. It was much more like what we did at Google was interesting, but we didn't do it quite right. Like let's do it right. And that's, that's what we tried to accomplish. Okay. You started light in 2015, brought on those co-founders. And was it at Lightstep that you started the Open Telemetry project? And who was part of that project originally? And what's the story around that project? Yeah, good question. So um, th this is, I think, probably more into the topic that your listeners wanted to hear about. So I'll be a little bit, I'll elaborate a little bit more. So we started Lightstep in 2015. We initially were working on tracing, like that was the the goal. I knew from Google we actually wrote a paper about the work at Google called Dapper, which you can read if you're having trouble sleeping. Uh, but it says, I think even in the abstract, I think it says basically like, look, we were able to do this because we had a monolithic code base where you could make a very, very narrow um, code change to get coverage of almost the entire thing. I knew that in the wider industry, it wasn't like that. It's obviously incredibly heterogeneous and fragmented across languages and frameworks and so on and so forth. So you didn't have that capacity. So we were just trying to figure out how to crack that. And we went from everything from like, you know, hacks on top of correlated logs to like hijacking user IDs and using them as a trace ID to all sorts of ideas. But it actually started with um, 
a meeting that uh, Adrian Cole, who was the uh, creator of the Zipkin project, um, which came out of Twitter, uh, which was based on the Dapper paper, actually. So it had a lot of similarities to Dapper from a structural standpoint. He had organized a kind of like end user. Mm, I, it was like a ultra tiny little mini conference. There were probably like 12, 15 people who came to this thing and he did it once a quarter and we'd all fly somewhere and just talk shop. But these people were all trying to implement tracing at their organizations, not always using Zipkin, but often using Zipkin. And the days were filled with people's cool visualizations and all these interesting analytical things. And then the lunchtime and kind of, you know, drinks and dinner piece was people just complaining that no one could use their stuff because nobody could actually get the data out of their software. And we, real, we realized very quickly that the actual bottleneck for any sort of progress was that you did not have good telemetry, you didn't have any good data coming out of these systems. And that was definitely for sure the bottleneck for any kind of analytical value. And uh, and so I actually uh, proposed this thing called DCP, which was distributed context propagation. It was this idea of an open source project that just handled the idea of propagating context from one process to another, which is the, that's the hard problem. The rest of it's not very difficult. And I thought if we could solve that problem in an open manner, then, you know, all of the people in the room, but also lots of other folks in the industry would benefit from that. And so DCP got kind of, you know, we started rattling around some ideas and putting some prototype code out there and stuff like that. And then someone said, hey, that name sucks. And so we came up with the name Open Tracing. Um, so that was 2016. Open tracing ended up being, I would say, you know, moderately successful. CNCF had just been created around Kubernetes. It was uh, yeah. first Kubernetes, then I think Prometheus, and then the third project to join CNCF was actually Open Tracing. At that time, no one had heard of CNCF, and they were actually like soliciting us, like, "Hey, like this seems like something that would be appropriate for CNCF," and no one had heard of it. But I was like, "Yeah, it seems fine, whatever." Which ended up, you know, being incredibly good decision just from a market awareness distribution standpoint. But unlike most open source projects in CNCF, it was never an open core initiative. It wasn't something that only benefited us. It was always a collaboration with other companies and other vendors and providers and so on. And then that was fine until 2018 or so. And then Google open sourced a bunch of their stuff and called it Open Census. So for a couple of years, there were two open source projects that were doing essentially the same thing, more or less, but they each had, you know, they were same but different. And it was creating a lot of market confusion. I think we both agreed that one was not really that much better than the other. They're slightly different, but um, but that having these two things out there was enormously confusing. But I think we all were unwilling to budge on like literally uh, using the other one. <laughs> and so we ended up fusing them in open telemetry, which I think was um, ultimately like a really, really good thing um, that we that we eliminated the confusion uh, around open tracing and open census, both of which are pretty much dead at this point. Um, it's amazing that you know people don't even really know about them at this point, but they, uh, at the time, there was a lot of like angst from end users about which one to adopt. So we resolved that, although open telemetry was created in 2019, but didn't really get GA'd for multiple years, mainly because of the heritage of having these two projects that we had to create like a clean migration path for. So, uh, but open telemetry um, was, yeah, it was basically a fusion of the leadership of those two open source projects became the initial governance for OTEL. And uh, and then since then it's it's grown to become, I think a very successful project um, and uh, much larger than open tracing or open census were for sure. Did you end up having to like merge the code bases together? Well, I mean, what's interesting about both, especially open tracing, which was a very intentional. So Yuri Shkura, who was the creator of Jaeger, which is another open source tracing system, um, he was very influential in the design of open tracing originally. It, open tracing had more of a framework where there was an API layer and then implementation and some protocols and stuff. And then I think he argued, I think pretty eloquently for, you know, more of like a Unix like approach of having open tracing solving an instrumentation API problem, and that's it. So it's like incredibly narrow and just solves that one problem. So for open tracing, there really wasn't that much code. That was a weird thing about it. It was like a very important open source project at the time, but it didn't actually do anything. Like you literally couldn't do anything with open tracing. It had to be implemented by a provider, which could be Zipkin or Jaeger or Lightstep in my case or whatever, but without oh. a provider, it didn't do anything. It's so like just it a like specification. Yeah, and not even of a protocol. It was an API specification, not a protocol specification. So it didn't do anything. Open Census had a little bit more meat to it, but not much. Open Telemetry has a lot because it also has the collector. Actually, that's not, yeah, that was unfair. I said Open Census had a collector model as well. But 
they're kind of funny projects because they're the, primarily standards projects and standards typically don't have a lot of code. Um, you know, there's a lot of effort that goes into every, you know, aspect of the standard and a lot of discussion about downstream effects, but the, it wasn't like a big port. Uh, it was more of like a conceptual port and then trying to create shims and adapters to get open telemetry, sorry, open tracing or open census code to work correctly with open telemetry. So there's a lot of effort there, but it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, fusing whatever, you know, if Kubernetes and like Mesos or something had tried to fuse, probably would have been impossible, but like that would have been, you would have had to actually port a bunch of code. What was the difference between what you could do with open telemetry versus what you were doing at Google? What made it so easy to solve the same problem at Google with respect to consolidating to telemetry from all these services, so on and so forth, that you couldn't do with the differences in people's apps um, outside of Google? Yeah, so it really goes back. To, I thought about this a lot. I mean, so the short answer is pretty simple. is that Google, at least at the time, this is circa 2005, 2006, had an almost perfectly factored monorepo that really in production, the only languages in use were Java and C++. There was Python, but that was just on the edges. So production software only used two languages. It was all almost perfectly factored. And it was all in this just absolutely enormous monorepo, right? And what what's perfectly factored? I mean that if you made a remote procedure call from one process to another, everyone used exactly the same library. And there's no exceptions. Oh, and like with so, protobufs. Like, well, yeah, protobufs and also, you know, stubby, which I think became gRPC when it was. Got it, got it, got it. Worked. So like, top, but, okay. But, Understood. but, but, but that and everything else, like if you wanted to run a bunch of, you know, if you had an async pattern to have some kind of epoll thing in Linux that had stuff built on top of it, everyone used the same set of software primitives to build that kind of, you know, closure library and things like that. And that's really, really important to get right. A lot of people with tracing, uh, they think, hey, if you capture the network calls, then you're good. That's absolutely not the case. The hardest part about tracing is actually inside the process. You get a call comes in at the top of the stack, a bunch of work happens, often involving, you know, queues and handoff and batching, and then more work happens, and then you make a network call. And somewhere in all that software, which is just user land software, no system calls, you need to keep track of the context. It's a very, very difficult thing to solve um, coming in after the fact. But at Google, just through, you know, sheer... Uh, I don't know what to call it, I guess good software design or something from people early, early on, there was actually a common library you could use. And if you instrumented that, then you basically got coverage of everything. And I remember when we pushed out the initial versions of Dapper in production, no one really knew how that was going to work. Um, but it worked for read-only services like web search. It was kind of remarkable. And you push this thing out. And on day one, basically, of having this out in the world, you could like 12, 15 layers of microservices all the way down the stack, perfectly captured because they all use the same libraries. It was just really remarkable, you know, side effect of, I think, very good software design from people who came in early, like 1999, early at Google from um, Digital's uh, research lab who were like world-class systems researchers. And they just kind of like did a bunch of best practice systems programming very early on at Google. And I think that was um, that was a big deal. Uh, the other thing I will say that's interesting about Google, notable that made this possible, was that there was no GitHub. There was no, there was nothing. I mean, the only open source stuff out there was Linux, right? So it's like if you wanted to do user land stuff, you had to just figure it out. And because Google had really was the first at scale company to build on commodity hardware, they had to write all their own software stack to handle the unreliability of the hardware, which is unusual. So they did have to write their whole stack. Like if you were to start a new company today, you don't really have the choice. It's like, if you want to compete, you have to reuse what's on the internet and on GitHub, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Google didn't have that option. So because they had to DIY, I, I mean, it probably slowed them down by a couple of years, but uh, but it did mean that they had the opportunity to build this perfectly factored code base. And that's really what made Dapper uh, tenable, I guess, you know, from without something like open telemetry. In terms of the OTEL project, it sounded like, you know, things on the open telemetry end started to really heat up in 2016, 2017, and you were working on that project. How was it related to what you were doing at Lightstep? And do you think that like that is perhaps one of the things that that sort of like brought you guys out to the world, like from a go-to-market perspective, had like a uh, an impact on the company? 
Sure. And I'll, I'll just briefly say for, you know, people who are listening to this, I wouldn't expect anyone to have detailed knowledge of the observability market and the various players, but LightStep started in 2015. Um, we uh, initially were a tracing company. That's how people perceived us. We eventually started moving into other areas, which was always the intention. Um, but part of that tracing uh, association really was because of the open tracing project, which we were not the only vendor associated with, but we had a strong association with that and would kind of market around that. And that was kind of good early on. I think it gave us a wedge and gave us some initial traction, but ultimately was problematic from a positioning standpoint. Lightstep was acquired by ServiceNow in 2021, where I still work actually. And that's been great for us um, in terms of just having access to a much broader market. And ServiceNow is kind of incredible in terms of their... Um, the value they create from just a big global 2000 enterprise kind of standpoint. Um, it was something that was hard for us to access as a startup. So, you know, that's kind of, that's, been, that's our go to market, you know, wedge now is just being part of this much larger company that has a very valuable product. They sell to a lot of companies, right? But early on, yeah, it was incredibly important for us for market awareness. Um, the thing that happened though, is that we, and I think probably, open tracing and then open telemetry wouldn't have been successful otherwise, but we were very careful not to create a, a tight coupling between that project and LifeStep. As I said, it was not an open core model. We always, we actually made a very concerted effort to bring direct competitors into the governance of the project, which made them not terrified of it, right? Because otherwise it would have been like this Trojan horse for LifeStep and no one would have wanted to work with us, but we made that a priority. And I think that was successful. That's why the project is successful now. It has, you know, it's second only to Kubernetes in terms of just the amount of commit activity across the entire CNCF and has, you know, I've lost count of the number of vendors that support it at this point. Um, but that did make it impossible for us to use it as a, uh, you know, there's a common pattern with commercial open source software where you have this open source thing that's really just kind of a marketing effort and then you like upsell people. It wasn't really possible for us to do that. In the very early days, it worked that way because no one else supported it. But once there were other vendors supporting open tracing and open telemetry. Um, I think it's been helpful for us from an awareness standpoint, but it really hasn't given us any particular commercial edge. Certainly if if we made like 10K a year for every end user that adopted Otel, like we would we would have IPO'd many times over, right? Like, uh, but then again, if we tried to pulse something like that, I think the project would have failed immediately. And I'm, I'm glad we did that. And it's also interesting because you could have predicted when creating open telemetry that the project in and of itself doesn't promote vendor lock-in, but you thought it was good for the world. And for that reason, it makes no sense to have it be tied to LightStep. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, if it, if it had um, locked people in either directly or indirectly, I mean, if you think about the world before open telemetry, the value prop for what was probably called an APM at the time was, I mean, this is just marketing terminology, but the, that's what they were called at the time. Like the value prop for an APM was primarily the agent, right? Which was a way of getting the data out of the software. The analytical side of the APM was actually really basic, uh, but the agent was something you paid for. And then if you look at the way that they would allocate research and development, you know, like, you know, circa 2015, uh, you know, an app dynamics or a Dynatrace or something like that, which were the, you know, the big players or a new relic, whatever they probably I'm, I'm guessing, but I would guess they've spent 70 to 80% of their R and D resources on agents. Like it was a huge endeavor. So for all of them, it was a huge, huge, huge lift. Cause that's, it's a big project. Uh, end users didn't like it cause it created a lot of lock-in. Um, and then ironically, it wasn't really differentiating for any of them. So it was a bit of this war of attrition because like none of them could really afford to continue to instrument everything in the world. It's a black box, which is what agents do. Um, so they, you know, despite the fact that it was marketing for them, uh, it wasn't differentiated marketing, which as you know, isn't that valuable and it was long-term unsustainable. So I think most vendors actually realize that it's a little painful innovators dilemma, innovators dilemma wise to do this, but that they actually need to find a different strategy long-term. So that's part of why open telemetry has a lot of vendor support is that ultimately it allows them to focus their innovations on the analytical side, which I think is great for the market in general. And I think the market has benefited from a proliferation of really powerful tooling, you know, not uh, highlights certainly among them that can benefit from, um, you know, the playing field moving towards the analytical value side and away from the agent side. That kind of is a good segue into the question of 
if you were to start Hotel from scratch, are there any things that you would have, like you would focus on more early on or emphasize more earlier on, um, given that you've sort of witnessed the growth these last years? Yeah. Um, well, I guess if I could do one thing differently <laughs> with Hotel, uh, would have been like to start with the hotel scope in 2016 instead of in 2019. Cause I think that really was the, the probably the right scope, like uh, not just to be an opinion API layer, but to do that. Cause then we would have avoided if you include the time it took to support, you know, uh, migrations from open tracing and open census, we kind of lost like three years of development, which for an hotel is a long time to all of that nonsense. So that's the number one thing I would do. But the, if you ignore that piece and say, okay, forget that, what I actually would go to a governance issue. My biggest concern with hotel is that, uh, you know, bless its heart as a project, it is being run entirely by engineering. I mean, I'm an engineer, so I, I get it, um, which means that there's a natural bias to work on greenfield stuff that affects greenfield applications. And then if you go out and actually talk with giant, you know, enterprise adopters, hotel, there's good news and bad news. I would say at this point, I cannot walk into like a G2K customer conversation as part of my current role. I can't find one that's not adopting Otel. They're all adopting Otel. But I, I don't have data for this. But if you said, hey, like, let's look at every single thing that you care about from a telemetry standpoint, and what percent of that is presently exporting into some Otel format or using Otel or anything Otel related, it's probably like less than 1%. I mean, it's, it is vanishingly small because it doesn't support legacy stuff. And that is a totally solvable problem. Like IBM actually has put a lot of people on Otel for mainframes. And surprisingly, if you are doing your firmware updates or whatever, your, your old school IBM main, mainframe actually o emits OTLP. Like it's not like it can't be done if it's a priority. But the problem with Otel is that from a governance standpoint, um, it never was set up to really prioritize. It was not set up as a product organization. It's set up as like an engineering thing. And we're not doing a great job because it's not an open core project of actually listening to end users and meeting them where they are, which is that they're dealing with a bunch of brownfield stuff and a little tiny bit of greenfield stuff. And Otel works beautifully for the greenfield, but they're actually much more concerned with the brownfield. So my biggest concern with Otel is actually structural around prioritization. The people are fantastic. The work is fantastic, but it tends to bias very heavily towards what's new and, um, and you know, oh, we need to do EPBF. We need to, you know, support some totally brand new thing in Kubernetes. That's fine. I don't mind that it's happening, but we're missing where most of the market actually needs Hotel right now, which is to, as an alternative to proprietary agents for mostly legacy software and infrastructure. And, and that, that's what I, I wish we were doing more for, but it would almost require a reboot on the governance for Hotel to fix that, which is, you know, kind of out of scope, I think. Even if that weren't the case and there was an effort to do it, where would you start? Like it, the attack vector for that is not it's very clear. Well, actually, maybe it's very clear to you. So I'm curious what you think. Um, it's not not super obvious. It definitely would require a lot of effort. Um, but I think if we had um, a, a mechanism to bring on, you know, major end users as kind of like an in, you know industry board to complement the governing committee for Otel, and there I should be clear, there is an end user working group, and it's, I don't mean to to to. I don't want this to sound negative about any of the work that is going on. I think that is really important. But if you're, like when it comes time to like actually prioritize things in the project, it's just not being done outside in, I guess. And I, I think there are mechanisms to do that that are well known from a product management standpoint, but would probably require all the vendors involved who are basically con donating their engineering resources to agree on a prioritization mechanism. And it's just really hard to do that. Like people, are, I'm glad they're willing to donate resources to the project, but it's hard to... Or is, I mean, frankly, everyone would want to orient around their own customers, right? So it's like Dynatrace and Splunk and ServiceNow, whatever, all there. Like, whose customers are we going to prioritize? Well, you know, I'm sure we all have our preferences on that, right? Not to mention the potential to poach each other's customers. And it, it, I'm sure it gets complicated, right? But like, that's the way I'd like to see it work. I'd like it to feel more like a well run, you know, customer centric product organization um, than uh, something that's just, you know, purely driven by, um, you know, what, what seems most interesting, which is, I think, what's happening today. I, I'm sure people, if anyone from Otel listens to this, I'm sorry. I mean, people might disagree with me about that. I'm being a little bit hyperbolic, but but I, I think the spirit of what I'm saying is we could be better about uh, being end-user focused. 
And it's always a trade-off too, because I'm sure uh, you're going to get a lot less pushback for getting Otel into these greenfield projects. Whereas we could probably all agree that doing it for these older things yeah, there's a little more of like uh, trying to navigate the maze of figuring out where to start and who to get uh, to agree to things. Esplan, did you have a question? I was just going to ask uh, how you think about observability, cost, and cardinality. <laughs> uh, so for metrics and specifically or just in general? Uh, just in general. I saw some tweets that you had about that. And that was- so um, cardinality. I, I don't... Um, think that cardinality would be a problem if it wasn't for the fact that people, their approach to doing observability is often taking their monitoring, which is the thing that's supposed to tell them when something is wrong and is like their first line of defense. They're trying to use their monitoring tool to do observability, which is both monitoring. That's an important aspect of observability and also ad hoc investigation. So what that looks like is, hey, I got alerted because my latency is too high or we're running out of CPU or whatever. Okay, fine. So you You get alerted, you go to your dashboard, and then the only tool you have if you're using a metric system is to try and group by filter, group by filter, group by filter. So you'll say like, I want to group by host and then filter for the the host that's running out of CPU or group by customer and focus on the customer that has high latency or or whatever, right? Um, And that's fine, except that when you want to group by something, that means on the back end, you have to be continuously storing all of those different time series that you're grouping by. And that's what cardinality is, and it's very expensive. I am totally at peace with metrics being a really important aspect of monitoring and even observability. But when you get down to that level of of detailed investigation, um, you're basically saying you have to pre-compute everything you might care about in advance. And that is not a good strategy. You must have something that allows you to make more flexible queries uh, to investigate um, the, you know, the, the source of some change um, that you might see in your monitoring. So the cardinality problem, I think a lot of people are trying to tackle it by saying, oh, you know, our unit prices for metrics are lower, or, oh, you know, we, um, uh, we allow you to avoid metrics altogether. I don't think either of those is the right answer. Metrics are incredibly important. They're absolutely the best way to do like high frequency analysis of important signals, which is why they're the lifeblood of monitoring. But you have to have a way to, to gracefully have a, not a, a developer or SRE who does not want to become an expert in observability it has to be able to pivot from their metric signal to an ad hoc investigation without realizing that they're changing telemetry types um, and and uh, be able to ask questions that involve more cardinality and and that that's where we have to go with it. I mean, there are different ways to approach that problem, but but that's the end, end goal for sure. Because the issue is if you have to store everything, then it's just all about efficiency of querying it and you're just storing a whole ton of data. So is this is a trick then to think a lot about how you store your data and store like the pre-computed values? There's some kind of Venn diagram here, but hard to do that verbally. I mean, for for metrics data, you can do, you know, very high frequency queries and um, you know, really uh efficient long-term evaluation of queries, but you can't do high cardinality. Um, for structured events, whether you call that tracing or log or logging, it doesn't really matter. Actually, for this purpose, um, you can um, you have you know fewer or no restrictions around the cardinality, but you pay for every event, right? The beauty of metrics is like if if your web server does ten queries per second or ten million queries per second, your metrics cost the same. It's just like you just count them. It doesn't. It's just a different number. It doesn't cost you anymore. For for you know logging and tracing, there needs to be some kind of strategy around retention or sampling or cold storage or all three or whatever. And that's where it gets hard. So, you know, the, the fly in the ointment for metrics is cardinality. The fly in the ointment for tracing is sampling. Um, uh, logs, I think, are, you know, really just a kissing cousin to tracing. If it's done correctly, that the two probably converge. Um, but uh, similar things can be said there. So, uh, so yeah, you kind of trade one problem for the, for another. I think when you hear people who are doing tracing at scale, they complain about sampling. People doing metrics at scale complain about cardinality. If you do them both well, you can kind of pivot from one to the other. But you know, it's it's not easy right now. And I think it, that's an area that just frankly needs to improve. Um, I see people doing it well, but they're usually experts. And as one of my beloved colleagues at Google said, nobody wants to be an observability astronaut. That that's exactly right. Like it's no one should have to think very hard about this stuff, and and they do, unfortunately. I feel like we're kind of done with the questions. I think I went over the questions. I feel like 
Ben just did a good job of telling the whole story and, and going through things. Ben, if it's cool, we can wrap up. Thank you for coming. We appreciate your time. It was fun to meet you. Thank Thanks, you. Ben. Take care. <laughs> we'll be in touch. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. See ya. All right. <laughs> Bye. Bye.